When I was a student here, I had to wear a tie. <laughs> when I came back as a prof, I still had to wear one, and they didn't. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, you know. It just <laughs> I thank God for Biola. I mean, you stand for truth, and if you haven't picked up a hand up, raise your hand, we'll get you one. And um, I know you're gonna learn a lot of truth here, but what we need to learn is how we live it out in life. In your outline, there's a little statement. God's providential care is humanly incomprehensible combination of God's permissive will and divine intervention into the affairs of humanity in such a way he causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. I look back over my life and I see some of the greatest lessons of my life just came out in living that, that truth. And uh, one of the first things that I discovered early on was leaving aerospace engineering, which I was for four years, uh, going off to seminary here and then into ministry that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, Paul says. I remember going through ordination, and on Saturday I thought, well, it's a formality, I've gotta go through and do it. But something happened Sunday morning, folks. I mean, it, it turned out to be a much more inspiring thing than I really had anticipated. The point is, is that on Friday and Saturday of that week, I could have gone back and been an engineer. On Monday, I couldn't. When I left, I stayed on as a consultant because they needed me. Actually, I needed a little money, but, <laughs> uh, but I realized what I was doing. I was just keeping my foot in the door. And then I learned that any man who puts his hand to the plow and look back is not fit for the kingdom of God. God's will for your life is on the other side of that door there. And so really, what is it? Why do you want to know? So you can decide whether or not you want to go through that door? You probably will never discover the potential in your life until you solve an issue on this side of the door. If God is God, he has a right to decide what's on the other side of that door. And if we don't give him that right, we may never actually fulfill our potential. And uh, then you do what I do. You go through the door and stick your foot in it for a little while until you pull it out and move on with life. And I do believe that the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. I mean, it's, the test of a person's character is what does it take to stop him? And so God has called you into ministry. He's continued to call you into ministry. And unfortunately, you see people fall along the wayside along the way. The second lesson that I learned I did in ministry, I took a position down at Lakewood First Baptist in Long Beach. It's crazy, isn't it? Anyway, uh, from there, I took on a senior pastor role. And I walked right into kind of a buzzsaw. And I knew almost immediately when I got there that I was heading for trouble with a board member. He'd made life miserable for the previous pastor and now he's making life miserable for me. And um, I really can't be intimidated. I'm not much of a fighter, but I'm not afraid of confronting. So I went up to his house. And I said, I don't think things are right between you and I. And it was like negotiating with North Vietnam. A war? What war? You know, it was uh... anyway, I asked if he would meet with me every Monday morning. I said, if we got a problem, let's work it out there, not on the board. So we did for six months. I can't tell you how much I hated those Monday mornings. In the midst of that, I had an opportunity to go to Israel, and uh, so I asked the board, I said, could I put together a tour? And he shot up his hand, he said, no, I'm against that. If he gets enough to go, he can go for nothing, that's like giving him a bonus. So I said, well, if that's gonna be a problem, then I'm just requesting vacation, so I went on my own, which I was glad I did, because it ended Monday morning meetings. And, um, <laughs> And uh, when I got over there, I knew what would be a special place. I almost knew it before I got there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a beautiful mosaic structured church called Church of All Nations and the foot of Mount of Olives and <clears throat> Eastern Gate is right up there. And I heard the spiel about where the Lord prayed all night. I came back the next afternoon and just sat there. And just the realization of what he was doing really hit me. I said, uh, he had to take all the sins of the world upon himself, and I had to take the sin of one man. I said, I can do that. No, I will do that. I mean, I really kind of went through a crisis decision. I'm convinced to this day that forgiving others as Christ has forgiven us is probably the most Christ-like thing we'll ever do. And uh, <clears throat> that night, I went back to the hotel, and um, 
I had paid for a single room because I didn't want some guy snoring in there, ruining my whole trip. And, and, uh, but I woke up in the middle of the night with an overwhelming sense of God's presence. Uh, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. All I could say was, it's just too good. It's just too good. Is this what heaven's going to be like? I've never forgotten that. I woke up the next morning. It wasn't a vision. Uh, I clearly remembered everything. Never forgot it, to be honest with you. Often wondered, what's that all about? It wasn't really a game changer. I went back, stayed a husband, stayed a father, stayed a pastor. And, uh, but something had broken in the spiritual realm, and he didn't have me to pick on anymore, so he picked on my youth pastor. <laughs> that did it. I don't know about you, I can take more myself than I can watch another innocent person take. And so I went to the board and I said, you either do something about him or, or the staff is resigning. And, uh, and I was dead serious about it. And uh, so I got a letter, two weeks later, we've called for a meeting for the two of you to come ask each other forgiveness and let's build our building. Great. Sweep it under the carpet, we'll trip over it later. Well, I did go there and I did ask his forgiveness for not loving him because I didn't. You know, it's interesting. I said, it's one thing to forgive another person and then to go back and work with them. It's one thing to forgive. It's another thing to love. You're going to learn a lot at this school, but the goal of our instruction is love. It's from a pure heart and good conscience and a sincere faith. Well, seeing they weren't going to do anything about it, I decided to resign. Except I couldn't because I got sick. I mean, I literally really got sick. Worst of my life. I think I got temperature was 103 and a half. Now, it doesn't take a genius. God is not pleased with my decision. The denomination leader came in. He preached that next Sunday. And, and uh, so I stayed home another week. And I rolled out my resignation Wednesday morning. Wednesday afternoon, I lost my voice. Totally. I couldn't say a thing. I didn't resign the next Sunday either because I still couldn't talk. So the denomination will come in and say, boy, this is exciting. Your church has doubled. You're growing. You got new property. I said, yeah, I know, but I'm going to resign next Sunday. And he taught me. I tried to talk me out of it, but I was stubborn. And so I'm laying there flat on my back, nowhere to look but up. And I was reading through the Gospel of Mark. And somebody brought a blind man to Jesus. And he put a little mud in his eye and said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees. He touched him a second time. He said, now what do you see? He said, I see men clearly. Whew, I got the message. That's how I saw him as a tree. He was an obstacle in my path. He was blocking my goal. Oh, no, he wasn't. I think God used that man more than any other man on this planet to make me the person God created me to be. I said, uh, God will do that sometime. You just stick up an object right in front of your path. There, what are you going to do about that? You know what the flesh will say? Give me a chainsaw, man. I'll cut that thing down. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, God, there's nothing in me to love that man. You're going to have to touch me. And God did. I finally got to church. I preached on that passage. I said, there's two types of people in this world. There are people uh, who see people like trees. You know, they've had an encounter with God. I said, but we're not trees. We don't scratch each other with our branches. We don't compare our leaves with each other. Then there are those who have been touched by God who see people clearly. I gave an invitation that morning. I don't know what for, just invited people to come forward. They poured forward. The doors opened up in front of the church. They spilled out on the lawn. The organist and the pianist couldn't play anymore because they were crying. People were going across the aisle asking each other forgiveness. It was a revival. I don't think there were no more than about 10 people still seated. Care to guess who one of them was? <laughs> <clears throat> You know, he never did change, to my knowledge, but I did. I was never really the same after that. And I look back at that. If I had gotten my way, I probably wouldn't be here today. I mean, I would have resigned with nowhere to go. And uh, so I thank God that he struck me down. And to me, the hardest lesson in life is to learn the love of the unlovely. That's what God is. That's the goal of our instruction. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the heathen do that. The, goal, the love of God is not dependent upon the object. God loves you because God is love. It's his nature. That should become part of our nature. And to me, I look back over my life. That was the hardest lesson I've ever had to learn in my life. Let me read a passage out of Isaiah. Uh, 
Isaiah chapter 50, verse 10, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze, this you will have from my hand, and you will lie down in torment. We're not talking about the darkness of sin. We're talking about the darkness of uncertainty. In the light, you can see the path ahead of you. You know where your friends are. You can see the obstacles. But in the darkness, every natural instinct says, sit down, drop out, stop. And Scripture says, keep on walking. Keep on walking in the light of previous revelation. You never doubt in darkness what God is showing you in the light. I call it God's ministry darkness. That has happened to my wife and I three times profoundly, profoundly. While I was still at that church, my wife developed cataracts. Her mother had it when she was 40. She got it when she was 40. In those days, they wouldn't do lens implants. So they do uh, let the eyes cloud up, and finally she had surgery. Well, being a pastor's wife was enough pressure itself, but losing your eyesight was kind of overwhelming. So I needed to get her out of that role. Frankly, that was my motivation to get my first doctorate. I had no idea what God was going to do with that. And I told her, you don't have to go to church, you know, uh, you know, but I was working my way out of that. And uh, so we got into our brand new facilities and uh, church got stabilized and, and um, had grown. And I took a year off for study. What made it possible was I had a, a friend at Pepperdine at that time that uh, was willing to loan me in two segments, $10,000 interest free. I had equity in my home, so when I graduate, I'll sell my house, pay them off, and, and my kids could stay in the same school and wouldn't have to move. So that year, I took 43 semester units, 17 were language, took my comprehensive exams, did my research, wrote my dissertation. Well, when you're out of money, you don't look to the left or the right. I mean, you just really <laughs> focus on it. Well, halfway through, I had finished my coursework, but I had to take my comprehensive exams and God turned out the light. I mean, everything was clear up to that point. I was right on schedule, and God turned out the light. And I found out the second 10,000 wasn't going to come in. I had no money. Cupboards were bare. Kids were taking popcorn balls to school. At that time, it wasn't a question really of pride or anything. I mean, I would flip hamburgers to take care of my kids. I just didn't know what to do. I mean, it was the 11th hour and the 59th minute and the 59th second. <laughs> I mean, it just got down to just bare bones, darkness. It's like God drops you into a funnel, and when you think it's dark, then you hit the narrow part. Or think of it this way. He kind of stretches you through a knot hole, and about the time you're going to break it in half, boing, you go out the other side. But you never go back to the same shape you were before. But I'm in the bottom of this funnel, and it's dark. And it was a Thursday night. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night. I mean, it was a God thing like... I'd never experienced before. No visions, no voices, just the way he has of renewing your mind. My wife sensed it as well. But the essence of it was this. Neil, you say you walk by faith. Do you now? You're going to learn the rules of faith here, but you don't learn to walk by faith until you're put in a position where you have to trust. And uh, I said, do you love me or do you love my blessings? What if I suspended my conscious blessings for a while? Would you still love me? Do you worship me because of who I am or because of favorable circumstances? Boy, in a way, I can't explain to you folks. But in my heart at that time, I could tell him, yeah, it's you I love, Lord. Of course I walk by faith. I trust you. All that happened one night. Nothing had changed in my circumstances. The next morning, I got a call from Glenn O'Neill, dean of the Telva School of Theology. Have you taken a position yet? I said, nope. He said, can you come over? I came over here, this school. Friday afternoon, they offered me a position I kept for 10 years. That night, that was 1981, I think it was. Interest rates were 19%. You couldn't sell your house. I had my house up for sale, but nobody could buy it. And 10 o'clock at night, Friday night, next day, a guy from my church that I resigned from came over. I said, Chuck, what are you doing here? He said, I don't know. I said, well, come on in, and we'll figure out something. And, and, <laughs> I looked at him and said, you want to buy a house? He said, maybe I do. <laughs> Came over Monday with his parents and bought the house. Now I moved over here to San Feliciano and knew where I was going to come to Talbot. 
And it was amazing how all that just unfolded just the next day. But it was a testing time in my life. You know, do you love me or do you love my blessings? And uh, my role at that time essentially was to hold on to Joanne and say, this too will pass. This too will pass. Isaiah 20, 21 says, how far gone the night? Watchman, how far gone the night? He said, morning comes. Folks, you hang on to that. No matter how dark the night, morning comes. Hope comes. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here today. And uh, he said, where does this come from? Well, look at Moses and, and Abraham. God called Abraham out of Ur into the promised land and gave him a covenant, promised his descendants would be the stars of the sky, the sands of the sea, and then he turns out the light. Days go by, months, years go by, actually. So many years that his wife goes beyond the natural means of childbirth. And then one day he turns aside, I must see this marvelous sight. And Moses saw the light, and Abraham, the temptation, if you look at this passage, is don't create your own light. The problem is we don't see it God's way, so we do it our way. And you know what happens? Misery follows it. So his wife was beyond the natural means of childbirth, so you can understand why she said, go into my handmaiden Hagar, which he did, he created his own light, and the whole world lies down in torment, Arab Jew. Same thing with Moses. You know, God superintends his voice, raises him up in the course of Pharaoh, puts a burden in his heart to set his people free, pulls out his sword, sets God's plan back about 40 years. 40 years later, tending his father-in-law's sheep, he turns aside. I like what the text says. I must see this marvelous sight. I would have said, look at that! Anyway, it was a, it was a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. And he got the message as well. God turned the light back on, and he became the Old Testament deliverer. Uh, it, it's really fascinating how you look back. I don't think he's going to ask us to wait 40 years like these great people did, but there are times in our life where we just keep waiting upon the Lord. I'm in a ministry that doesn't try to make it happen. I've become convinced you just let it happen. And you wait. You wait for God. You know, vigorous young men struggle badly, but yet those who wait upon the Lord, they'll show mount up with wings like eagles and run and not walk and not faint. But uh, that was our first experience with that. And then I came over here, I'm teaching at Talbot, and uh, they recommend that Joanne have a, a lens implant. Cosmetic, they said, at first insurance. Then they finally came over, and Joanne really wasn't for it, but she, she came out of it phobic. It, it surprised me, to be honest with you. I, I, it, was, it wasn't natural for Joanne, and, and that set off 15 months of the darkest period of our life. You know, I'm sitting here, I'm watching God just, you know, renew my life and sending me up for the ministry I have around the world today. And, uh, and I'm seeing God set people free, and my family's kind of going down. And, uh, I mean, we were really struggling. Honestly, while I was on faculty here for 15 months, I didn't know whether John was going to live or die. And uh, it just kind of went on and on and on. And um, I had three of Job's friends show up to help me out during that time. <laughs> and um, which can be kind of painful, folks, to be honest with you. Uh, one day I was at a soccer match and uh, on Saturday morning, and I came home and there was a note on the door that my wife <clears throat> had checked her into the chemical dependency unit at Whittier uh, Presbyterian Hospital. And now Joanne was really skeptical about going into any kind of medication, and she had been on an antidepressant for three months. Well, you don't become chemically dependent upon three months of antidepressants. That's bizarre. But I mean, this just came out of the blue. And we'd sold our house to pay off medical expenses. So, I mean, at that moment, we were dead broke. I said, what? I mean, where did this come from? Well, there was a lady at the church who talked her into that because she herself had divorced her husband, who was a doctor, who had given her any prescription meds that she wanted to, and she had become chemically dependent, and she talked Joanne into it. And Joanne, poor Joanne, she was so desperate, she couldn't sleep during that time. And, and uh, so I raced over to Whitty area, and... Uh, but I couldn't see her. They had a 48-hour rule. So I went into the administrator. I said, she's not chemically dependent. Well, you're in denial. No, I'm not. <laughs> I said, I don't have any insurance to cover this. Uh, how did she pay for it? Oh, she laid down your MasterCard for $3,000. Now I was dead broke and $3,000 in debt. So I had to wait for 48 hours to see her. And the only way I could see her for three weeks was to sit in a group and say, hi, I'm Neil, I'm a co-addict. 
codependent. I went on for three weeks. And to make life interesting, at that time, all the staff was gay. I remember saying at the beginning of it, you know, my wife is a very sensitive soul. I said, I'm really concerned how she's responding here because the language is really kind of bad. Oh, man, when I said that, the wrath of hell came upon me. I got called every name you could think of. And uh, we just, I just sat there for three weeks, you know, sitting in a circle, writing out my story, cooperating with them. And finally, Joanne just checked herself out. And, uh, and we left. We weren't there for Joanne. We were there for me. God revealed some things in my heart during that time that were not pretty, folks. My natural bent would have wanted to judge their character, question their program, whatever else. In three weeks, listening to their stories, the hardship they're going through, just changed my whole mind. Later, I was able to write with one of our staff, freeing from addiction. There's no way I could have even considered that, you know, years earlier. And God has a way of disclosing, you know, the condition of our heart to get us beyond our own judgmental arrogance. And uh, it was a truly a, a broken experience in my life. And we um, went out and found another counselor for Joanne, and this happened to be a lady, and she said, you know, I'd like to talk to your husband. Uh, I want to hear the other side of the story, which I thought was good. I think you should do that. And so I went to meet with her, and she sat there and complained to me about her husband, and uh, that she's getting a divorce, and basically propositioned me. I said, dear God, we can do better than this. I mean, it was like God just gave me a crash course on what is available in our society for people who are struggling with these kind of problems in life. Almost from that day on, my whole life in ministry was nothing but to seek answers. Things changed so much here at, at Talbot for me at that time personally. You're probably looking at the only pastor teacher ever who's written books on anger, anxiety disorders, depression, chemical addiction, sexual addiction, because I really believe church is the answer. Truth will set us free. Christ himself is a wonderful counselor. I just presented at the American Association of Christian Counseling last week. I had the largest workshop there, 700 came to my workshop. They invited me to do two training videos, AACC, a pastor. That's the grace of God, folks. And uh, we now have a ministry around the world. So here I am, I'm coming back to Biola University, and it was really one of the lowest times of my life. My wife didn't know whether she was going to live or die. We had a day of prayer on campus. And I remember, you know, emphasizing prayer in my classes. The undergraduate students were taking communion down at Chase Stadium. And I went down and sat on the floor. I had nothing to do with the program that day, but it may have been one of the loneliest points of my life. I just sat there and took communion with the undergraduate students, and, and God spoke to me again. Neil, there's a price to pay for freedom. It cost my son his life. You willing to pay that price? I said, God, that's the reason I'm willing. But if some stupid thing I'm doing, please tell me. And I left there, I knew it was over. And it was. She woke up within a day and she said, I slept last night. Never looked back. Never had one revisit of that whole 15 months of darkness. Why? Why would you go through something like that? Well, I think I was a reasonably kind person beforehand but not like you are afterwards. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. But the real essence of it was, young people, God brought Neil Anderson to the end of his resources so I could discover his. I had no idea up till that time how much my stoic, self-sufficient Norwegian background was my greatest enemy to my sufficiency in Christ. I doubt if anybody in here knows any better than I do that I can't set a captive free. I can't bind up the brokenhearted. Only God can do that. 
That was the birth of Freedom in Christ Ministries. Every book, every recording I did was all after that. And uh, had I looked through that door 30 years ago and saw what my family would have gone through for me to be here today, I'm not sure I'd have come. But looking back, I'm glad I came. God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. Was there a third time? Yes, there really was. Uh, eight years ago, my wife said, when is it our time? I've been traveling all over this world, and I said, you're right, hon. I'm going to get off the road. And I made a commitment to not to travel internationally so we could have some retirement time. We never got it. She uh, got dementia. And uh, for seven years, I took care of my wife. I'm the only one in seven years that ever gave her a shower. Never missed a meal. Did some of my best writing during that time, to be honest with you. But no social life, whatever. A year ago, October 2nd, she passed away. Three years prior to that, I was sitting in front of my computer. And I heard from God saying, she's not going to get well. And from that time on, I was just committing my life just to take care of her. And... Uh, but I also, during that time, experienced the presence of God in a way I never, frankly, had ever before. And it just continued. I wrote a little book called The Power of Presence. It's what my presence meant to my wife, but it's what God's presence meant to me. And the peace that I discovered during that time, I wouldn't exchange for anything. So I dropped out of the bottom of that funnel about three years ago, Joanne, last October 2nd. And, uh, I share that with you because I, I look back and they say, gee, that was a hard story. But to have the privilege to see God right in front of you, set a captive free. To heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. It takes something to happen within us first. We have to experience the grace of God. We have to humble ourselves. We have to deal with our own pride and rebellion. And then once we're ready for that, then watch God use you. You won't learn all of that here, folks. Some of it you learn in life. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.